everybody doing tonight oh, i'm awesome i am uh, i'm very excited i've had uh quite a few shots of coffee today so you guys get to be on the lucky end of that so for those of you that don't know who i am i'm mark i'm the youth pastor here i have the privilege of uh being in charge the head of whatever of the coolest youth group ever i've got some of the most amazing kids and we are in the middle of just an exciting new season because uh, as you may well know, we have this new unit that we're going to be sharing with Brickyard Boxing down there, and we're actually able to go and just do our thing down there. We're able to yell and scream and don't have to worry about what's going on in the main room. So, because too often I'm up there having to go, shh, they're going to hear us. We don't have to do that anymore. We can just get, like, crazy. So, but I did want to, you know, put out a shameless plug because I'm the youth pastor that if you have any teenagers, 12 to 18, Saturday nights typically at this time is where we'd be going down there to do that. So, it's an awesome time. I actually have a couple of guys here, but some of the other youth are down in the kill, uh, children's wing and they're actually helping out down there. So, I just love that our teenagers like to serve. So, I, I'm really blessed by that. Um, I'm excited because I, I've had this message on my heart for a while. Um, just this idea of, of stepping up in prayer, stepping up in expectation of what's going to be happening in prayer. It's really been on my heart uh, for a couple of months now. And this is actually like the second message that I've gotten to preach about it. And it's just something that has completely taken over me. So uh, can I just warn you, I may explode Jesus all over you guys tonight. So you guys are just going to have to deal with that. <laughs> yeah, I like Donnie right here. This is good. So uh, last week, Jason was uh, sharing about promises and how God's promises are yes, and we get to live out the amen. God's promises are yes, and we get to live out the amen. And I kind of want to tag off of that about how we need to be a people who are expecting in prayer, that we are expecting uh, to see God move whenever it is that we're praying about something, whenever it is that we're seeking him for something, to be expecting him to do something in our lives. And so... Uh, I was actually really thinking about just some different expectations that I've had in my life and how you can really kind of base your expectations off of what you're expecting off of uh, the character of somebody, of who they are as a person, as a friend, as, as a relative, whatever it is. But you can, you can measure your expectations based off of how well you know them. And can I, can I just say that I, wanted to, I just wanted to talk about an awesome character, and that is the character of God, because I think so often we will just kind of skip over what is the character of God. We'll come to prayer, and we'll, we'll, we'll spend time in prayer. We'll throw off these little cool, you know, oh, God, if you could help me out in this. But I think sometimes we forget who he is. And so I just wanted to take a moment before I actually get into the, uh, the meat of the message, and I want to talk about an awesome God. I want to talk about a fantastic God. I want to talk about a God that's so incredible that he's able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that I can think or imagine. I want to talk about a God that sends down every good and perfect gift. A God with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. A God who with a word spoke the planets, the stars, the galaxies, the universe as he hung everything in the sky. A God that spoke every living thing into creation, everything that we see and hear, everything that is part of our every single day life with a word. The same God that delivered his people from Egypt, who sent plagues and opened up the Red Sea so that his people could escape. But not only that, but then he collapsed that same sea onto his enemies because he said, no one messes with my kids. The same God that enabled a boy to defeat a giant with just a single stone who sent down manna from heaven so his children could eat, who knocked down the walls of Jericho, the same God who stepped into a fiery furnace with three boys who refused to worship any other God except him, the same God who sent his son to this earth, a God who was able to give sight to the blind, who was able to open the ears of the deaf, a God who can cure every disease, who with a word raised Lazarus from death's grasp, a God who takes care of my needs, my burdens, my worries, who cares about my wants, 
who can make something beautiful out of the ugliest circumstance, who disciplines me, who shapes me and molds me as I submit to him. A God that is faithful, just, and true. The same God who sent his son to die on a cross so that I could have a relationship with him. Who took my sin and cast as far as the east is from the west into a sea of forgetfulness. The same God who raised his son from the dead. Who sent his Holy Spirit to reside in his people. The same God who is love. Whose character is perfect. The same God is full of grace and truth. The God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The God who is so magnificent and beyond measure. The only name that even comes close to describing who he is, is I am that I am. Do you know the God that I'm talking about? See, that's the God that I want to talk about tonight. Because when I look at expectations of what it is that I can come to my God with, I start to realize that there are not limits to what I should be expecting from him. Instead, I should be setting my sights so much higher. So much greater than anything that I've ever thought to expect from him before. Father, I just pray that as we step into this word tonight, Lord, that you would open it, that you would share with us what it is that you want us to hear, God. That you would speak to every single one of us. God, I pray that the words that need to be said, that those would be the ones that you would have me to say. God, I pray that you would change every single one of us, always for the better. I love you so much. Sometimes... I feel like we've gotten to a place where we treat God like everything that I just read is just a historic fact. That's something that happened in the past, but he's maybe not around. Sometimes I feel like people treat God as if when Jesus died on the cross, that was the end of the story. That he's still residing in a tomb. That's something that we can look back and that we can look back at and go, wow, that was kind of cool. That he would take my sins on a cross, but my God raised him from the dead. And that same God is alive today. And he is working inside of me. He's working inside of you. He is working everywhere. That same God. And so that's what I want to talk about tonight. My hope and my prayer is that throughout this series of expectation, our prayer life will become one that reflects the God that we serve. Because if it truly does reflect the God that we serve, then can I tell you, there is absolutely nothing that can stop us. There is nothing that can stand in the way. There is no thing, no fiery dart that the enemy could send that is going to stop us from serving him, from doing mighty things for his kingdom. Is it because of anything that we can do? No. It's because of his character. The character of the living God allows us to come in prayer with expectation, knowing that he is going to show up. As I said, knowing the character of somebody actually kind of opens the window as to what it is that you can begin to expect. When I was uh, living out in Seattle, uh, I'd gotten out of master's commission. I'd been uh, working out there for about four or five years. And I came back uh, to visit Shauna. And while I was here, I had the opportunity to sit down with Jason and Bob. And I started to hear about this dream. This dream of starting a church out in East Missoula. And... I started praying about it, and I started thinking about it, and and I could feel God speaking to me. But there was something else that came into play in the middle of that, is that I could have an expectation. See, for me, I'm very lucky because I've actually had a relationship with Jason for a very long time. He was my youth pastor, and so I've been able to come out of that ministry and be a part of everything that's going on. So I've known him for a long time. So when I heard that he was going to be starting a church out in East Missoula, I already knew his character. And I knew that if I was coming on board with this, that I could expect to see God do great things because I knew his heart. That's a shameless plug for my pastor, and I am not afraid to say that because I love my pastor's heart, and that is earning me brownie points right now. So, but when we know somebody's character, we get to expect certain things. We get to start looking at them and say, you know what? I know what's probably going to be happening here. I know the direction that's going to be happening. When we know the character of God, we know the direction that he is going to be taking us. We know that he has good things in store for our lives. And all we have to do is just walk according to the path that he's laid out. And we know that awesome things are going to happen. If you guys have your Bibles with me, uh, with you tonight, you can open them up to Acts 12. We're going to be going through verses 5 through 16. You can also uh, go on to, if you have some sort of portable electronic device, You can follow along on our uh, interactive, or I will also have it up on the screens. 
just because there's so many different ways. But Acts 12, 5 through 16. And can I just say what I love about the book of Acts is that we look at all of the other epistles that are in the New Testament. We've got, you know, all these letters to the Corinthians, the Ephesians, the Colossians, the Philippians, all that kind of stuff. And But Acts is the book where we get to see these guys who are writing all this stuff living it out. It's like they're, they're, they're preaching about it in all of these other books that are there. But in Acts, you get to see what it is that they actually are walking through. They're just building their faith, bringing them to the place where they get to write what has become the word of God. That is Incredible. So whenever I read Acts, I get really excited. I'm a very excitable person, apparently. So to set the scene of what it is that we're going to be talking about, we got um, what's just happened right before this is that James, the brother of John, has been killed. And if you've read through the Gospels, you know that Jesus basically had an inner circle that was going with him all the time. And it was James, John, Peter. Those were the three that were always hanging out with him. And so James has just been killed. And so you can imagine that for the early church, this is a pretty big blow because this is one of the main guys has just been killed by Herod. Herod, who was trying to obliterate this idea of Christianity because that was infringing on his ability to control the people, he basically, he wanted to just completely annihilate them. And so he figured out, oh, killed James. This is going to hurt him. I'm going to go after the next one. I'm going after Peter. So he goes and he gets Peter and he puts him in prison. And that's where we pick up right here. Peter, in verse 5, Peter was therefore kept in prison. When the enemy figures out a way to get you down, he's always going to do it. It's like that, just stopping right there. Peter was therefore kept in prison. Herod figured out a way to keep the church down. Satan figured out a way to get them distracted. He says, I'm just going to start, I'm going to kill the head guys. I'm going to go after them. I'm just going to start taking them out. And so Satan, he's basically going through and he's saying, I'm going to do whatever it takes to keep you down. And I'm going to keep doing it over and over and over and over again. Can I say, after being one of the guys that comes up here and prays on a regular basis and seeing how many times we pray for cancer, Satan has figured out what is going to keep the church down. When we have to pray for finances, Satan's figured out what's going to distract you from doing the will of God. That's why it's important that we pray. Because he already knows the buttons that he has to push with you. Now it's your turn to, t- to turn around and say, I'm going to fight back. I continue reading. But constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. Pray without ceasing is the first verse that comes to my mind whenever I think about that. But constant prayer was being offered. You see, these guys immediately, as soon as they found out Peter was in prison, they gathered together. They didn't wait until it had already been going on for a while. Well, maybe he'll get appeals. Maybe this will happen. They saw something was happening, and immediately they jumped into the next gear and said, we're going to start praying. We're going to start meeting, and we're not going to stop until we see something happen. Constant prayer started getting offered. And this is also another point where I get to throw out an awesome plug. 5 p.m. Tuesday here. There's going to be prayer in this room. It's going to be open to anybody who wants to come in. I would suggest if you have nothing else going on, come, be in this place, pray with other believers, and you will see God move on your behalf. So shameless plug. I'm all about him tonight. So, Verse 6, and when Herod was about to bring him out, when Herod was about to kill him, that night Peter was sleeping, bound with two chains between two soldiers, and the guards before the door were keeping the prison. It's a pretty hopeless situation. He's bound up between two giant beefy guys. He ain't going nowhere. In verse 7, now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, and a light shone in the prison. And he struck Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. Then the angel said to him, Gird yourself and tie on your sandals. And so he did. And he said to him, Put on your garment and follow me. So he went out and followed him and did not know that what was done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. When they were past the first and second guard post, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them of its own accord. And they went out and went down one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. How cool is that? I mean, you know, he's, 
you know, we start to see what else he was up against. Okay, he's already chained up. He's between two giant dudes. I'm sure he's behind a cell. He's got all of his stuff. Now he's behind a couple of different guard posts. Plus, there's a giant gate. That's a pretty big, hopeless situation. I mean, if you look at having everything stacked against you, that's having everything stacked against you. But, I mean, when I read this, I'm, I am a youth pastor, so I kind of look at things just a little bit tilted. Uh, but I love video games. And so when I look at this and this whole idea of how Peter comes out of the situation, I was like, when, when I was a kid, there was a certain game that I would play, and I got really good at it because that's what you, all you do when you're kids, right? Yeah? Amen? Yeah. But I'm like, you know, I came to this one level where basically you start out, and the only thing that happens is as soon as you start, all these guys shoot at you and you die. And that was, that was like this level. And so your only hope in order to make it out of this level alive was to get the cheat code entered in fast enough before they could kill you. And can I say it? Like, to me, that's kind of what happened here, is that Peter's, like, sitting there. He's, like, chained up. Big guy here. Probably could take one of them, but not both of them. He's got this iron gate. He's got these guards. He's got all this different stuff. And all of a sudden, whoop, angel shows up. Cheat code. Oh, check this out. I just get to kind of walk on out. This is awesome. He goes beyond these guards and everything like that. And he comes out and he starts looking around. And in verse 11, he says, when Peter had come to himself, he said, now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the Jewish people. He was in a hopeless situation and all of a sudden God showed up. Can I tell you, when God shows up in the midst of any situation, it doesn't matter how dire it looks, freedom is there. The chains, the things that are holding you down, the things that have bound you up, the things that have been keeping you from getting to where it is that you need to go, all it takes is God showing up and he's like, oh, there's freedom here. He didn't even have to do anything except for just show up in the situation. He didn't have to take out the guards. He didn't have to knock down the gate. It all just happened. It's like, well, it's kind of like a dream. No, I'm just like, walking out. Fantastic. He knew it had to be God. He finally figured out that there, it had to be God. No other explanation made sense. Sometimes I think that God waits just a little bit so that he can come back and say, it's like, see, that was me. See, if I, if I had just had, you know, just one puny guard there, I was like, you would have tried to take him out on your own, and then you would be thinking that you're all big and bad. But this was me. There was no way that you were going to be able to get out of that. It was me. That's how cool God is. I look back at all the cool stories in the Bible, and you always see God just kind of, it's almost like he waits just a little bit longer just to go, oh, yeah, watch this. They don't think I can do this. Watch, watch, watch. Boom! Yeah! You guys awake now? Yeah. Verse 12. So when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. Whose house is this? This is John Mark. Now, John Mark is actually the guy who wrote the book of Mark, so he's kind of a big deal. I mean, if this was the Green Bay Packers, he may not be, you know, all of the main guys. We're talking like Clay Matthews, Randall Cobb. I mean, he's still a big deal. This is where all the big deals. If you are not a Packers fan, I just feel bad for you because you totally miss an awesome analogy. But it's a big deal. There's some pretty heavy players when it comes to the early church. So these are people who were like praying hard, right? That's what they're doing. But then there's this girl, Rhoda. Now, Rhoda, I loved because Rhoda, you're going to see in a minute how she seems to be the only person that actually had faith in this entire room. However, Rhoda is also a little ditzy. So we're going to get to that. Continuing, uh, verse 13. And so Peter knocked at the door of the gate, and a girl named Rhoda came to answer. When she recognized Peter's voice, because of her gladness, she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter stood before the gate. <sighs> Just imagine the situation. Peter's outside knocking. It's like, who's there? It's Peter. Open up. Peter! 
She, like, freaks out, goes off running. She's, like, tweeting people. You're never going to guess who's here. Updating her Facebook status. Feel bad for Peter. He's just hanging out on the other side of the gate. That moment when you realize that you're a wanted felon. You only live once. Hashtag. So he keeps knocking while Rhoda encounters something just a little bit different. She goes and she's telling everybody that Peter is outside the gate. Now, obviously, based on just this one sentence that we really know about Rhoda, they're probably looking at her going, you're crazy. And they do. But and verse 15, but they said to her, you are beside yourself. You're crazy. Yet she kept insisting that it was so. Can I just say that there are times when you've been praying for something, when you've been pushing for something, and all of a sudden somebody comes in with just a little bit of faith. You don't even know what you're talking about. You're crazy. There's no way. You're crazy. But she keeps persisting. She keeps pushing. She says, yet she kept insisting that it was so. And so they responded, oh, that's awesome. Let's go and open the gates and welcome Peter. No. They said it must be his angel. It must be his ghost. The very thing that they've been praying for, that they've been gathering together for, is just right outside the door. But they're like, you know what? There's no way that this could actually be happening right now. I've given up. I'd already given up. You know, I'm, I'm offering prayers, but it's more like just the, the hope in the wind. I'm not really expecting anything to happen. That's what I love about Rhoda is that if you look at that verse, she didn't even open up the door to find out that it was Peter. She was there. She's like, who is it? Peter. And she freaked out just at that because she already knew God had already released him from prison and he was at the door. Left him there, but he was at the door. So she, she was the one who had the faith. This girl, that this is the time that she gets mentioned in the Bible, she's the one who had the faith. He was actually there. You see, the people had already given him up for dead. My God doesn't forget his promises. Maybe that thing that you've been praying for is just there. It's just about there. It's right outside of the door. And as I was thinking about it, I started thinking about that verse, how all God's promises are yes, and we need to live out the amen. God's promise was yes. Peter was out of prison. He was just hanging outside at the gate. He was out of prison. But they needed to live out the amen. They needed to go let him in. The promise was there. They just needed to go and get it. They just had to go open up the gate. Now, Peter continued knocking. When they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. And I think about that, and I'm like, were they really even expecting? Were they really even expecting that he was going to get out? Because they were completely blown away that this would even happen. I'm definitely guilty of this. I know that personally I've been walking through a lot of different things in my life, and I've been praying, and I've been seeking, and I've been saying, God, when is this going to be happening? And I've been just coming to my edge. But then at the same time, I can see little things coming along, and I find myself being astonished. And I'm like, why am I astonished? I should have been expecting all of that all along. I should have been expecting the character of God to shine through this entire time. God's promise was yes. We need to live out the amen. I love coming to God with his promises. I know Jason talked about this last week, but I think that this is one of the most powerful tools that you can ever have when you are praying, is that God lays out his promises in the Bible, and we get to come to him with them. We get to come and we get to say, God, you said. How many parents I got in the room? Anybody? Anybody? Yeah. How many times do you ever have your kids come up to you and go, but you said. I loved listening to what my dad would say when I was a kid because I would hold him to it. Anytime, there was this one trip that we were making where we were going along and he was explaining to me what a speed limit was. It was like supposed to be a five-hour trip and the speed limit, they had been changing it to 55 and he was not going that. And so when he started to explain what the speed limit was, I'm like, dad, you said. The, the speed, you can't go over that little line right there. You're not, it's, you're at the, you need to be back at the 55. 
So I turned that trip into like an eight, nine, ten hour trip, something like that. He was really excited about it. But whenever I would come up and I'd be like, Dad, can we have pizza? And he'd be like, uh, well, how about next Friday? You better believe next Friday I was like, hey, Dad, remember you said that we could have pizza tonight? I got pizza. I got to go to movies because I remembered what he said. The same thing goes with God. We need to become confident in our prayer life, expecting God to fulfill his promises. God, you said I can boldly approach the throne of grace. You said that I can ask and I will receive, that I can knock and the door will be open, that I can seek and I will find. You said that if I say to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea and have faith, if I expect it, it will be done. You said you are good and you give good gifts to your children. You promised that if I'm faithful in my giving, that you're going to open up the windows of heaven and pour out such blessings that I can't even receive it all. You said that you're going to work every situation together for the good, for those who love you and are called according to your purpose. God, you promised never to let me walk through more than I can handle. God, you said you're my strength. You said you're my peace. You said you give me wisdom, that you give me understanding. You said that by your stripes I am healed. In James 5, 13 through 18, he says, is any one of you in trouble? He should pray. Is anyone happy? Let him sing songs of praise. Is any one of you sick? He should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. But this next part is amazing. It says, the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. The way that I grew up reading that is the prayer of a righteous man availeth much. That if you want to see some incredible things happen in your life on your behalf, pray. Pray. He goes on to say in verse 17 and 18, Elijah was a man just like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. And then again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. Elijah, a man just like us, just like you, just like me, just like us, prayed. You remember Elijah? Remember this guy who was hanging out and he was having a competition, like a war of the gods, you know? You've got all of these prophets over here of Baal and they're like, you know, freaking out, cutting themselves, saying we're going to rain down fire. And he's like, oh, that's cool. Yeah, watch what my guy could do. Yeah, why don't you just go some, pour some water on that and uh, no, a little bit more. Okay, God. Let me step back. <laughs> Takes out all the prophets too. A man just like us, who serve the same God that we do. Prayed, expecting, believing. What will happen when we start to pray with expectation that God is going to show up? What happens if we dare to be the people who aren't just going to throw a quick prayer into a wishing well? That aren't just going to throw a little hope into the wind, but we're actually going to expect God to show up on our behalf. That we're going to expect God to fulfill his promises to keep his word. I'll tell you what would happen. We'd see financial situations changing. We'd see job situations changing. We'd see drug addictions, alcohol addictions, pornography addictions, smoking addictions, all sorts of addictions just fall by the wayside. We'd see chains of bondage being broken. We'd see marriages being strengthened. We'd see children growing up following God. We'd see diseases being cured. Cancer wouldn't be an issue anymore. We'd see loved ones coming to know Jesus Christ, to have a relationship with him if we would pray expecting God to show up. God, ex just believing him to show up at his word, to fill his word. How do I know? How do I know that all those things would happen? Simple. He said. As the worship team gets ready to sing this last song, I want to give an opportunity for us to have a moment where we can bring 
the things that are going on in our lives, and we can expect God to do incredible things. And I'm going to ask the prayer teams to come forward and just to stand at the front. But before we get there, I want to make an opportunity. And maybe the expectation that you're looking for in this room tonight is just to start a relationship with God. To just start a relationship with Jesus Christ. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. All you got to do is believe. And you can expect that he's going to show up in your life. That he's going to show up and you're going to have a relationship with him. That every sin that you've ever committed is going to be cast as far as the east is from the west. It's going to be cast into a sea of forgetfulness. Not to be remembered anymore. If you're in this room, if you would just bow your heads and close your eyes, I just want to take a minute. And I want to make this opportunity. That if you're here and you say, I want to take advantage of that expectation tonight. Not out of anything that I deserve, but an expectation out of the most amazing character of God, that he gives his grace to me as a free gift. If you're in this room tonight, and you say, Mark, would you please, please pray with me? There's nobody looking around. I'm not going to call you forward. I'm not going to do anything like that. But I just want to pray with you where you are. Just simply raise up your hand right now, and I'll include you in my final prayer. Is there anybody at all? Say, tonight I want to start this relationship with Jesus Christ. Okay. Anybody else? One more second here. Okay, we're going to pray this prayer. But immediately following that, if you're here and you say, I've got something that I'm praying and I need somebody to pray with me so that I can expect God to do incredible things on my behalf. And there will be prayer teams up at the front and we will pray with you and we'll sing along with a song and we'll worship God. But the key is, let's begin to expect God to come through to fulfill his word. Father God, if everybody would actually just repeat this prayer with me. This is just... If you're in this room and said, I wanted to make that dedication to follow Jesus, to have that relationship with him, or maybe you're just rededicating or just anybody in this room, just repeat this prayer after me. Just say, Father God, I love you. I believe in you. I thank you for sending your son so that I could have a relationship with you. I love you. And I believe in you. That's it. Just as simple as that, you start that relationship with him. As the prayer teams come forward and as these guys play this song, just come with expectation. Whatever it is that's on your heart, whatever it is that's going on in your life, friends that are stuck in addictions, family members that don't know God, financial situations that need a breakthrough, whatever it is, Come expecting.